do we know why the Israelis are postponing their attack, their ground attack on Gaza Strip? Well, I don't know specifically. All you can do is speculate. Um, there have been a couple of different explanations of the press. One, uh, the United States said, hey, don't do anything until we get all of our military forces uh, in the region so that we can support you. Uh, that's one possibility. And again, these are not mutually exclusive. Uh, they are not ready from a training standpoint uh, to uh, go into the Gaza uh, because uh, they're largely a reserve force. And it turned out in activating 300,000, they didn't have enough body armor, not enough food. So the Israel is really caught unprepared for this kind of mass mobilization. And they may not have established the sufficient logistic support. So, uh, and there may even be some within the uh, Israeli defense forces that are arguing not to go in this way, recognizing that it could be very devastating and debilitating for Israel. Uh, it could uh, really damage uh, their military capability uh, through the losses they'd suffer. Is there any chance for them going on the ground and finding Hamas? Oh, they'll find some, I'm sure. And, you know, Hamas is going to fight them. And it's not just Hamas. Uh, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad is another group uh, that's in the Gaza Strip. Uh, there'll be others not even affiliated with either Hamas or the Pidge that will probably join in just out of anger, revenge over civilian casualties that have been incurred. So this is, you know, this kind of urban fighting when you've created all this rubble, uh, blown up buildings and blocked streets. Uh, it's it's a recipe for disaster. It is, you know, we've, we've seen examples through history. You remember at the start of World War II when Germany invaded Poland, Poland fell in about well, less than a week, two weeks tops, the entire country. Whereas uh, when the Nazis tried to clear out the Warsaw Ghetto, uh, the Jewish residents of that ghetto fought back and they held the German army at bay for a little over a month. And they did, they would just had, you know, piecemeal uh, firearms, you know, a, a rifle, uh, a pistol, something they'd picked up maybe from a, a dead German soldier. So even lightly armed, they were able to really create a big problem that forced the Germans just to completely level the place. How do you see the changes that are happening in the Muslim countries like Turkey, the Netanyahu administration? Are they considering all these changes that are happening day by day, minute by minute in the region? No, they, they're not. Uh, I, I've been warning about this now since uh, shortly after the start of, uh, you know, first the Hamas uh, and terrorist attack on Israeli uh, settlements and military outposts, and then uh, the Israel's response by, you know, killing civilians in, in the Gaza Strip. That this, the images coming out of the Gaza Strip of the dead babies and the dead children and the lacerated women, uh, yes, Israel shows its images, too, from October 7th. There were some horrific things, and Hamas was uh, absolutely brutal, uncalled for, unjustified in any sense. But this is not a matter of saying who's got the, who's got the worst set of victims. Uh, because if you're going to just do it by numbers, the Palestinians have got the Israelis outnumbered 7 to 1 now, 8 to 1. The casualties are just going off the charts. And those images are being broadcast around the Middle East, not just on Al Jazeera or Al Arabiya or RT. It, it's on social media. And the social media may be controlled or contained inside the United States, inside parts of Europe, but it's not being contained in uh, Turkey, Iran, Iraq, Abu Dhabi, Qatar, Saudi Arabia. Morocco, Algeria, I mean, it's going everywhere. And it is evoking a backlash like we have never seen. Israel is now its own worst enemy. And it is so filled with rage and anger that they're just not thinking straight. So you've seen not just Erdogan, who everyone was considered, you know, big buddies with Bibi, Netanyahu. 
and that uh, uh, you know, I just saw one, uh, I guess, one of the Israelis who helped broker that uh, relationship between Herzog and Erdogan back, you know, years back, uh, expressing great, almost anger at Erdogan for what he said. He he refuses to call Hamas a terrorist organization. He calls it a liberation organization. Well, you can't always take Erdogan at what he says. I mean, he's been known to say one thing and do another. But this is a marked change in rhetoric, significant. Uh, the Queen of Jordan, uh, King Abdullah's well, wife, she gave an interview to uh, CNN, I guess it was yesterday, day before yesterday, uh, decrying what she called this double standard, this hypocrisy of the West focused only on Israeli losses and not, not saying a word about what the Palestinians are suffering. And the backlash that's come from the West against her. But if you watch the video, she's not crazy. She's not ranting, screaming. She's very rational. She's being very logical. And so, so what we have here is wh whatever relationship that used to exist between the, the United States on this hand and the Middle East on this hand is just being torn apart, completely broken. And uh, the West is making, uh, particularly the United States and these members of Congress, are making a very, very dangerous mistake in failing to understand how these uh, images of dead Palestinian babies children and women are it fueling outrage across the muslim world and it's not just people in the streets the leaders themselves are, are say drawing the lines and no no this has got to stop and it doesn't help that uh, israel's ambassadors uh, like at the un and in the united states are, are just they're, they're flat out obnoxious they're they're not diplomatic at all they yell they threaten uh and and that's you know that's just making them uh, less popular to put it that way considering these huge changes that are happening right now do we know anything about the israeli politicians from the right from the left from the middle are they all in for this policy of attacking on gaza do we know any force any political force inside israel who's opposing this kind of policies there's some but it you know, recognize, uh, as I'm sure you do, that Netanyahu, I think, only garnered like 33 percent of the vote during the last election. But he was the plurality. He had the most votes of everybody. And so he had to go out and forge alliances with other parties. And he he forged alliances with the most radical uh, right wing parties. And when we call them right wing, let's be clear what we're talking about. We're talking about uh, People who believe that all of the area of Israel that uh, is now part of which is called Palestine, all of that belongs to Israel, and that those people who are living there need to be expelled, and that this is God, God gave them that land, and it is their land, and there is nobody that can tell them not that they can't have it. So you've got that kind of political force on Netanyahu's side that he's got to pay attention to. So, yeah, there's a significant, there's probably at least 40, 45 percent of the Israelis that completely reject Netanyahu. But we're seeing the same kind of phenomena that happened in the United States in the immediate aftermath of the 9-11 attacks. There, even the Democrats set aside their partisan antics and united behind George W. Bush. Uh, and there has been that initial uniting behind Bibi Netanyahu. But as, as the weeks go on, as uh, you know, Israel stalls in launching its ground offensive, as more information comes out about the complete lack of response from the Israeli military, uh, you know, still no good explanation for why that happened, uh, then, uh, you know, Netanyahu's uh, political base is eroding. And there are, you know, rumors that uh, he's running into great opposition, even from some of the generals uh, within the military command. How did you find Antony's Blinken speech at the UN? How rational was uh, that? Yeah, no, he's just, uh, you know, Blinken is helping destroy U.S. credibility. So the United States is no longer seen as any kind of honest broker in this peace process. And 
in the past, like during the 67 uh, Six Day War, the 73, the Yom Kippur War, even 2006, uh, Israel's incursion, invasion of southern Lebanon, 2014 Intifada, that in each of those cases, the, the U.S. president and the U.S. secretary of state could call on their counterparts in Turkey, in Saudi Arabia, in Egypt, and in Jordan, particularly in Jordan, and get both help and advice and support in trying to bring some peace to the region, trying to keep things from escalating out of control. Uh, that's not happening now. Uh, Blinken and Biden have zero credibility, including with the King of Jordan. Because uh, when you look at what his wife, uh, the Queen, was saying just the other day, uh, you know, th these were very making some very serious charges against uh, the United States, against Washington, for failing to show any kind of consideration for the Palestinian uh, suffering and taking entirely Israel's side. So it, it is, we're, we're at a stage right now in the United States uh, that anybody that tries to argue the Palestinian question is going to be shouted down uh, because uh, it's perceived as being favorable to Hamas. And, and they can't really separate, you know, the American mind so far. Most people can't separate Hamas from Palestinians. It's all one and the same. And in fact, many of the, the Israeli politicians are saying the same kind of thing. So they, they, don't, they don't see anything wrong in killing Palestinian children and women because as far as they're concerned, they're just, it's like the old, uh, the, the the U.S. Army officer who was uh, involved with the massacre of Indians, uh, he said, nits make lice. So they, they view them as subhuman insects, animals that must be exterminated. Now, if you remember when the war in Ukraine started, all the attempts on the part of Russians to make a negotiating table was failed because the U.S. was believing that would benefit Russia if they go after mm -hmm. negotiations. Right, right now, right. two resolutions have been proposed at the U.N., one by Russia, the other one by Brazil. Both of them were vetoed by the U.S. And because they're talking the same thing, the same rhetoric, they're talking that this would benefit Hamas. But how yeah. about this? civilians that are getting killed every day minute by minute how do you see this policy yeah it's uh, look it's not rational this is this is pure emotion uh you know there 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 are a lot of truths and in trying to acknowledge all those truths it raises some very uncomfortable uh questions and issues it is true that you know hamas made the most strident uh, heinous uh, declarations in its formation about eliminating, exterminating Jews. But <laughs> there's also evidence that Israel itself helped fund Hamas because they saw Hamas as a way to try to de discredit the Palestinian Authority. So, I, you know, if when you know what you're dealing with and you actually help it, and encourage it, you sort of lose your moral authority to complain about it when you've created it. And I mean, in this, we talked about this before, that going back into the, you know, the very emergence of the Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran, that for at least eight years, Israel was supplying weapons to Iran. And, you know, the I just listened to the Israeli ambassador condemning Iran as a terrorist state and oh it's been been that way from the beginning and yet <laughs> you know Israel had no problem looking the other way dealing with them for eight years because they were more afraid of Iraq and so it's just you know everybody wants to paint everything out there in complete black and white terms that these guys are the Nazis and the devil and these guys are the angels and the sons and daughters of God no it's not like it. it's a lot more gray um, and there are people on both sides, unfortunately, who are saying the most inhuman, uh, vile things about the others. And, uh, you know, and would have given the opportunity, you know, kill them. You know, so 
uh, you know, I'd like I'd like to see the killing stopped, and you know, to back away. I agree that you know Hamas has got to eliminate its uh, to demand that Israel cease to exist, and so, sometimes within this discussion, there is the difference between being anti-Zionist and anti-Jewish. Uh, the you know I think the biggest concern are those who don't draw a distinction between Zionism and Judaism, and uh, you know want to wipe quote wipe that out, and and I understand why the the Israelis you know they're scared to death right now, uh, and rightly so, you know it's um, it's a little bit like what happened to the South white South Africans as apartheid came to an end. Uh, all of a sudden, they were not controlling the security force. The, we're not controlling the army, and we're outnumbered. And that's that's sort of the situation Israel's uh, facing, I think. Do you think that this policy of the U.S., of the Biden administration for this war, for supporting the Netanyahu administration of bombing the people on Gaza would benefit Israel in the long term? Well, I don't think uh, I don't think that's so much the Biden administration supporting that. I think Israel's just saying that this is what we're going to do. And you know, maybe the Biden administration you know, possibly could have said, no, you know, don't hold off, you know, slow down. It, it is. You know, sometimes we do present this bombing as if they're just carpet bombing the Gaza Strip, and that's not the case. Um, if that was the case, there would not still be a bunch of buildings standing. And I, I would estimate that probably the actual damage uh, to the Gaza Strip is maybe two, three percent of all the landmass. Because when you got 2.3 million people and you've killed 5,000, I don't want to minimize the loss of life of five, six thousand Palestinians, but you know, that's a far cry from killing twenty percent of them. You know, to killing, uh, you know, two hundred thousand or four hundred thousand. So it's just, you know, there's the the media hype also tends, I think, to get to get in the way of having a, a rational, calm discussion about this. But at least the U.S. can put some political pressure on the Netanyahu administration. We see that at the U.N. What did happen at the U.N.? Right now, Lula just yesterday said what we're seeing right now in Israel is not a war. It's a genocide. You know mm -hmm. how you see the view of Brazil is far from there. They're, they're trying to be in the middle most of the time, not, not taking part. But right now they're talking like this. At least the U.S. can consider some sort of pressure on the Netanyahu administration to bring them to sanity. Well, they, well, they could try, but it, it's politically not not feasible for the Biden administration. When you look at the support, both on the Democrat side, among most of the Democrats, I'm exclu excluding the uh, Rashida Talib, and there are there are actual some Palestinians, Ohan, uh, Ilhan Omar. Uh, they they are seen as being very you know anti-Jewish. They're part of the Democratic Caucus, but but the rest of the Democrats. I mean Chuck Schumer, Jerry Nadler. You know you've got a very very strong Jewish contingent on the Democrat side in both the House and Senate, uh, who are advocating for Israel and want to give Israel as much as possible. And the same from the Republicans. If if, if anything, the Republicans are probably more aggressive. And, and, and demanding that uh, all military support uh, possible be directed at Israel. And in fact, this you know this recent proposal by Biden to the uh, 110 billion dollar request, of which about 60 percent, a little over 60 percent, was going to go to uh, Ukraine. I, I, I when I first heard that, I said that's not going to happen. Uh, Israel might get that. Now that gets to a different issue. Can Israel with uh, absorb that much money? You know, the, think of it. It's like uh, if I if I've got a, a bucket of water, you know, you know, four or five liters of water, and you're sitting there with a cup that's a half liter, you know, empty. Well, if I pour that bucket, it's just going to run, you know, overflow. I, I'm going to give you more water than you can drink. And that's uh, that's one of the problems I think uh, that Israel's facing right now, with there are, there are some equipment shortages, 
Yeah, but there are also limits to what they can absorb. Hey, I want to know what's your take on this left part of the Democratic Party, like Bernie Sanders. Yesterday, he tweeted, I'm calling for a humanitarian pause. He's not asking for ceasefire. What's happening to these people? What's happening in the political arena? Uh, they're, they're following the money. Uh, look, it's um, uh, I, I hesitate giving this figure, but let's say that a very significant portion of you know the billionaires in the country are Jewish and you know, their, their money talks and a lot of them favor Democrat causes and, and provide funding to Democrat politicians. Uh, it is, you know, it's, it's not because of some evil Jewish conspiracy. I mean, that's, you know, those anti-Semitic tropes are, are, are off. But, you, you know, the fact that uh, the Jewish culture encourages that kind of achievement in that kind of industry uh, you know, leads to them having a, a, a type of success that is really disproportionate to their size in terms of, I think the, the Jewish population in the United States is about 2%. But yet I think you'd find a uh, you know, much higher number as a percentage, uh, maybe 15, 20% in Congress between House and Senate are Jewish. Uh, so, you know, they've, they've translated their success into political power. And that's, you know, these politicians, Republican and Democrat alike, aren't going to run afoul of it. I mean, Palestinians and Arabs, they, they don't have that kind of clout in the United States at all. So it's just, you know, that's, that's the domestic politics of it. Now, what is, what's interesting is within the people, let's go at the under 30 crowd, you know, between the ages of 18 and 30, there is a growing number of uh, people in that age range who are empathetic, sympathetic to the Palestinian cause or support the Palestinian cause and have great animosity or antipathy towards Israel, including some who are Jewish. You know, there's, uh, there's some videos circulating of the kids at this one college campus tearing down posters that were saying remember the israeli victims of october 7th and one of the one of the girls tearing down the posters is jewish herself <laughs> so you know it's just i, I know that for uh, the the jewish adults over the age of 50 they're absolutely alarmed and terrified they they've never seen anything like this or th that's what they're saying and i and i have no reason to doubt their perceptions it seems that we don't see that sort of unity that we've seen in the EU for Ukraine war. They were right. all united. Right now, it seems that that unity doesn't exist when it comes to Israel and Palestine. But it's the hypocrisy. It's the double standard. So uh, early on, the West tried to make the case that Russia was engaged in gross human rights violations, blowing up hospitals, blowing up schools. Uh, the fact was that the Ukrainian military, the Azov Battalion in particular, were using hospitals and schools as military emplacements, and that when Israel did hit those locations, Israel had made went went to pretty good lengths in terms of intelligence collection to verify that there were no significant civilian presence in those in those facilities, and. Uh, yet the West tried desperately to portray Israel as this violator of human rights, complaining that bombing power plants and uh, and and uh, electrical uh, in interchanges were going to for, uh, threaten the populations, force them to be without water, without heat, that this was inhuman. And so when the United States took these arguments to the United Nations, they actually received uh, some significant support. It was a. It put uh, Russia in the position of having to veto a Security Council resolution. Uh, China abstained, as opposed to voting one way or the other. So, uh, the, but they made a big deal about it. But in terms of actual civilians being killed, it was very, very, very few, because Russia was not doing indiscriminate bombing, uh, and had the kind of weapon systems that could hit with precision. Well, now turn around in two weeks, you've got 
you've had more Palestinians killed in two weeks than you had uh, Russian speakers that lived in the Donbass that were killed between 2014 and 2021. So in that in that seven year period, you had fewer civilian casualties, even though there was indiscriminate uh, artillery shelling by Ukraine. Still, th those casualties were over or you know uh, overmatched by what happened in Palestine. So the Arab nations have turned around and said, "Where's your outrage about what Israel's doing?" Because the United States is making excuses that well, Israel's in a war, and when you're in a fighting for your life, you basically can do whatever you need to do. And I mean, and, and let's be candid as well about the UN, U.S. and British culpability in World War II because we felt we were in an existential threatened situation. We had no qualms whatsoever about killing millions of civilians. You know, people I've heard, you know, some radio uh, talk show hosts, you know, sort of gloating about, oh boy, we bombed Dresden. You know, Dresden was one of the worst losses of uh, German law, uh, civilian life. And, you know, it didn't hasten the end of the war at all, it just, just killed a bunch of civilians. Hiroshima, Nagasaki, uh, the firebombing of Tokyo by the United States. Again, the, once you decide to provide collective guilt, collective punishment, then you know the, the the moral compass gets turned off. And but what the United States is and Israel are now finding that uh, countries that had supported the United States against Russia are now turning their back. And they're saying, no, you've got a double standard. You're not applying the same standard to Israel that you insisted that we apply to Russia. You're just a liar. And they're saying that. Now, you know, Jordanian uh, officials, Saudi Arabian officials, Egyptian officials. Uh, so I, that, that's why I said the U.S. has a real credibility problem here. We know what's going on between Israel and Arab countries right now. How about Russia and China? How do you find them considering what's happening right now in Israel? Why well, I, I see them as trying to see if they can help find help the West find an off ramp because uh, they see this as heading towards, you know, a real a global war uh, th that would all, also involve them. Because, you know, see, th throughout this process, when you listen to U.S. politicians, we're talking about Russia and China in ways that we never did uh, during the so-called war. Yeah. We didn't call. Uh, didn't necessarily call the Soviets and Chinese our enemies. You know, we called them our adversaries. But uh, Richard Nixon still kept open lines of communication with uh, uh, Leonid Brezhnev during the 73 uh, Yom Kippur War, for example. Uh, but we don't have that kind of dialogue right now. Uh, and the West sees itself as, you know, the defining the axis of evil. Joe Biden the other day, uh, Russia, Iran, uh, North Korea, uh, and I guess, did he say China too? So, I mean, it's just, you know, when when you're laying out that kind of axis of evil, uh, you have, there's no, you know, middle ground for talking. Because you say the only, the only solution with pure evil is to destroy it. Former advisor to Zelensky's office said that the Russian army will take Avdivka and the whole system after that going to come down. What's going on right now in the Ukraine war? Well, uh, the Ukraine continues to lose and lose badly. Um, you know, there are images coming out on the Internet. They've got, they got guys with canes, <laughs> who having, you know, middle aged guys in their 60s with with a cane trying to walk and service uh, serve on the front uh, front line. Uh, there's one video that surfaced of this uh, female medic just weeping and wailing because uh, 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 crying about the losses that they've suffered, saying she'd never seen such terrible losses. So uh, the, the, the grinding down of this Ukrainian army is going on, and all of this is taking place while basically the West has completely forgotten about uh, Vladimir uh, Zelensky. Uh, I, you know, I put a, on my... On my blog the other other night, uh, sonar21.com, I put uh, up the, there was a song in the 1980s that was featured in the movie Breakfast Club. It was done by a Scottish group, Simple Minds. It was called 
don't you forget about me, you know, and that's exactly Zelensky's song right now. He's trying to trying to come up with some something that he could be relevant uh, again, be the the toast of the town. Nobody's paying attention to him at all. And just this week, you've had both uh, the Slovak Republic and the Hungary signal eh, no more no more aid going to Ukraine until. You know they're cutting it off. So the the unity that was once within Europe is is coming apart. It's fraying. The Ukrainian army is saying that the Russian are using mixed tactics. What do they mean by this mixed tactics? What does yeah, it mean I in have your no opinion? Idea. Yeah, I have no idea. I, I just, is there any you know, change? What... How do they fight right now? Did they change their manner of fighting Ukrainians? No, they've actually uh, the, the only thing that's changed in the last. Uh, two or three weeks is that prior to this uh, Russia was fighting basically let's call it a defensive uh, battle or it, it was a controlled a very controlled offense in which they would use heavy bombardments with artillery uh, both aircraft uh, and rockets missiles etc but before advancing troops forward to take over the Ukrainian positions it was a very slow process, and it was a very deadly process for the Ukrainians. Uh, Russia now is going more on the offensive, using more tanks and armored vehicles out in the open, and they've 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 had some losses. Uh, so Ukraine has not lost its ability to fight back at all. But in the process, uh, Russia has taken back some significant pieces of territory, and the Avdiivka uh, region, in in particular has long been a thorn in the side of the Donetsk uh, People's Republic. That's where a lot of this artillery shelling of civilians was coming from. And they were very heavily dug. The Ukrainians were very well entrenched there. Well, that's, you know, that's coming to an end. And in the process, it looks like you know, several thousand Ukrainian troops are going to be surrounded and forced to surrender. Uh, they They got those troops up into that region by redeploying him from the southern front. So, uh, you know, this uh, Ukraine is not in control right now. It is losing control. And uh, so Russia, I don't think Russia has changed its tactics uh, per se. It's just they have gone from more of a defensive position to an offensive position. Before this conflict started in Israel, we had the Ukraine war and the conflict in Taiwan. We know that mm -hmm. just recently at the GOP debate, Vivek Ramaswamy was talking about the Ukraine is dead. Let's get out of Ukraine and focus on Taiwan. Right now, a new conflict in Israel. It seems that Taiwan and Israel is much more important for the U.S. foreign policy than Ukraine. Yeah, I don't think you can really separate the three. Uh, if... The, the war in Ukraine is a proxy war of NATO against Russia. And the effort was to weaken, destroy Russia, force Putin out, hopefully break Russia up into five constituent parts, and do that in order to both prevent Russia from having formed an alliance with China. Well, that's backfired completely. So the sanctions to isolate and weaken Russia have blown up. Uh, it's forced Russia to become independent of the West and recognize and come to the realization that it doesn't need to depend on Western economic support to thrive. Then, uh, in the same time, that uh, brought uh, China and Russia together in a, in a de facto alliance, a de facto military, economic, political alliance. So uh, now the West is scrambling, you know, they want to try to uh, isolate China. You know, ch we keep talking about China as our enemy. And, you, you know, China, you know, we want to make China the uh, culprit, the, the villain in this. But I point back to 50 plus years ago when Richard Nixon went to China and agreed with the Chinese on the one China policy that Taiwan was part of China. What is it about that sentence? Taiwan is part of China. It's not Taiwan is independent of China. That's what the United States agreed to. And now the Chinese view the United States is, you know, 
welching on a deal, violating an agreement, and that feeling that that the United States wants to use Taiwan as a pad, as a launch pad, as a aircraft carrier, the fixed aircraft carrier can use against China militarily. And China understandably can look at the United States and say, you know, over the last 31 years, the United States has been invading any country that it felt it, it if that country wasn't doing what it wanted to do, it, they'd invade it. Just ask the people in Syria, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and Somalia, and Yemen, and, you know, just go around the world. Uh, so uh, this, the, the Chinese are looking at the United States in a way that, um, that, that they no longer trust us because they keep hearing us call them enemies. So the, it comes back to the Ukraine conflict that the, the, this whole thing is, it, it's all, it's all woven together. And what the United States is trying to do right now is portray it as we got to fight all of these fronts. And, you know, they, we insist that uh, we can fight Austin. Lloyd Austin, the secretary of defense was claiming the United States could fight a two front war. You know, he used the expression, we can walk and shoot gum at the same time. Well, hell, the United States doesn't even have a pack of gum to chew. We cannot keep Ukraine properly supplied with some of the military equipment it insists that it needs. And now we're going to shift all of that. What formerly was going to Ukraine is going to wind up going to Israel. Good luck. Yeah, you talk about Richard Nixon. I think he's one of the most interesting president of the U.S. His term was so short. When you look what he was doing with China, with Russia, it was so amazing. It's so sad to see what has happened to him. He could have changed all of these things that we are seeing, we are witnessing right now. Well, some of the some of his foreign policy moves were, you know, the opening to China, uh, trying to do, uh, develop uh, nuclear control regime with uh, Russia or the then Soviet Union, uh, what he did with respect to uh, Vietnam and, uh, you know, prolonging the war there, the damage that he did in places like Cambodia, you know, you could argue Nixon's policies, what he did, what he and Kissinger did led to that ultimate massacre, that horror that took place in Cam Cambodia when the Khmer Rouge took over. Um, so, yeah, he, you know, he, he was... He had some very strong accomplishments on the foreign policy front. He was just such a flawed individual. You know, he just, he, he was intelligent, but also a little malevolent. Uh, and uh, again, his own worst enemy. So, um, but he, he did, he had quite a following. And let's put it this way. Uh, I would certainly take a Richard Nixon today over a Joe Biden uh, or a Donald Trump for that matter. Uh, you know, Trump's instincts are right, but Trump does not have the kind of vision of, uh, you know, trying to figure out what, you know, what it, what it's going to take to keep the United States uh, in a preeminent position as a leader of the world. Because the United States right now is busily killing itself in that department. We're, we're destroying ourselves and destroying our influence overseas. Um, if Trump was allowed to be Trump, in terms of cutting deals and trying to uh, find a peaceful way out, yeah, I think America would be better off. Uh, he would bring, he would end the conflict, the animosity between Russia and the United States right now. And he would find a way to talk with the Chinese as well, to, to not have to, you know, not be threatening, not calling them names. Um, I would th think he would even try to do so in the Middle East. But the problem is, even within his own party, even people that have backed him up to this point, they won't allow that. They will not allow it. There is no willingness to say, you know what, we need to treat Russia with respect. Vladimir Putin is not Stalin. Vladimir Putin is not a new Adolf Hitler. And uh, we, we, Vladimir Putin is not intent on dominating, controlling the world. But that's that's the rhetoric. That's the message that's being put out there. And it's just, uh, you know, it's just dangerous. If there wasn't a Ukraine war for us right now, we could have managed the conflict in Israel in a better way, considering Russia's important role in that region. Yeah, yeah, I would, 
I, I think what because of what's going on in Ukraine. Now, again, think about this. Israel is decrying Hamas as Nazis. They are Nazis. And then Israel's been providing military support to actual Nazis in Ukraine. You know, they're wearing the swastikas. They've got pictures of Adolf Hitler tattooed on their body. They've got imagery on their uniforms that's uh, consistent with the SS. And yet Israel can support that. Again, it comes back to the hypocrisy. It just depends on which Nazi they like, which Nazi they don't like. Um, so uh, this, because of that, it has alienated uh, Russia towards uh, Israel a little bit and made Israel uh, Russia less likely to support Israel and more likely to look for, to become a, uh, an honest broker or at least a broker in the process that will favor the Palestinians. So, you know, it's uh, it is this war in Ukraine has had some other blowback effects that are, you know, that are hurting Israel and the United States. Mm -hmm.